that's it. Now, you all have this in your pack, and this is just a, a, a little snapshot of a few of the things that we, we did in researching this. Uh, it's quite comprehensive, and I would urge people to use it. There are some spare ones on the table if you can put it to good use with your colleagues, in the school, the college, take a few more with you. Um, I just want to explain why we've got this triangle, the black triangle, with the upright triangle with our logo in it. Um, Susie's explained the three things in the frame there, but the um, disabled people in Nazi Germany had to wear a black triangle inverted, and so we're sort of claiming it back, and for those who don't know, there were up to a million disabled people murdered by the Nazis, uh, and many of the, that uh, what happened at the darkest point of our history as disabled people was um, test that we were the guinea pigs really for, for much of what followed on in the rest of the Holocaust. So that's why we've had that there to remind ourselves and there are some badges over there that people can get. Um, the theme of visual arts, last year we did uh, language, the year before we did moving images, uh, we've got a whole lot of resources that are all on the website and uh, I'm actually quite fed up with people in education particularly saying well there's nothing, there are no resources, well that's one of the reasons why we create all these resources every year, there are now hundreds and hundreds of resources on this website. Now if we look at Art, the urge to portray, draw, paint, carve, sculpt our existence has always been an essential part of being human. You can go back 70,000 years to find the first cave paintings and drawings. And it seems every culture has wanted to, to do this. The other thing that's a constant is having an impairment, whether it be, uh, which we would say was a long-term loss of physical or mental function, and has always been part of the human condition. And so those two things, really, how do they interplay uh, and how do they intersect? Well, looking around the world, for instance, uh, ancient Egypt seemed to give quite high status to disabled people. Here we have a, a blind harp player, there are many short people in hieroglyphics and statues. In Hindu culture, uh, there are a lot of people uh, which there was a view of uh, reincarnation and therefore it didn't really count, you were sort of karma had punished you, but interestingly enough, Astra Kava, uh, who, I've probably got the pronunciation of that wrong, but is a mythical figure who had eight different impairments, uh, was much maligned by everybody, but in the end turned out to be give very wise counsel. If you go to another con uh, continent, uh, South America, you'll find bars is there, short people, People. Here's one of someone with Down syndrome. We go to Europe, uh, and here in the UK, 670 years ago, the lateral psalter. In the margins, individual hand uh, illustrations uh, show lots of disabled people. This one, I think, done as, at our expense, a comic, because I can't believe uh, disabled people are actually doing what's illustrated there. Uh, and then right up to date, uh, Acknowledge David over there, uh, as part of the disability arts movement, a photographer and a, a filmmaker. And I think that's fairly typical of where we want to end up today, with looking at the disability arts movement, which sort of reversed all of this oppression and sort of challenged it through a, an understanding that our impairment is not the problem, it's society's reaction to it, what is called the social model of disability. And we hold that analysis throughout. So let's have a look at some of the portrayal and representation that come from this ancient culture. First of all, in Egypt there was the god Bez, who was a short person, or a dwarf as they used to be called, a uh, god of dreams, dancing, and celebrated as a protector of women. In many birthing chambers there are pictures and sculptures of Bez there to protect women when they're giving birth. Across the Mediterranean, not so uh, positive, there uh, short people were trained to be lethal gladiators. You can see the spikes on their fists. Uh, they had, for the entertainment of the bread and circuses crowd, had to kill each other uh, for everybody's general delight. Um, or occasionally, in uh, the Roman uh, situation, someone in the ruling elite 
was born, as Claudius was born with cerebral palsy, and nobody really wanted him to be emperor, but in the end the Praetorian Guard put him on the throne, and surprisingly, not to us, he turned out to be quite a good emperor. Uh, incidentally, uh, another emperor of his uh, family, Julius Caesar, also had a hidden impairment called epilepsy. Uh, which he hid for most of the time, but you know, occasionally on the battlefield he would have had a, a fit and sort of gone away into a, a cloaked room or something. But he also managed to. So these two disabled emperors were the people that we've got to uh, blame for the English language because of its structure on Latin, because they were the two who invaded Britain. So you know, disabled people do play an important part in history. Um, medieval Europe coming on. We get a lot of biblical influence, of course, of the miracles. Here's a Bulgarian illustration from 1355 of uh, the parable of the uh, paraplegic, take up thy bed and walk, which of course is the cured uh, person after Jesus had come along and put his hand on him. Uh, then we have another example here, Sir William of York. This is in a, a window in York Minster. Uh, puts his hand on a blind woman and suddenly she can see. Um, or for mental health issues, getting rid of demons, as these were illustrated at the time, which probably would have been psychosis. Suddenly St. Guthrie, again, and you can see the demon flying off there, having been uh, exorcised from this woman. And of course, these miracles were something that pilgrims went all over Europe. There were many illustrations of this. But even today, people go to places like Lourdes, and unfortunately, miracles are in short supply. Uh, lots of people go with crutches and are blind there, and I'm afraid they come back in the same <laughs> way. Uh, as we go on a bit into the Renaissance, really the Renaissance brought visual art to the fore. The apprenticeship system that both Leonardo and Michelangelo undertook. It wasn't like going to art school today. You studied for seven years with a master and learned all the ways of doing it. Uh, but for the first time, with the growth of trade and the beginning of capitalism in the Italian cities, there was money. Money for patronage of the arts. And that's changed it from being just uh, the aristocrats or occasionally the church. So there was a, a flowering of much art. And it's interesting that both of these uh, who perhaps epitomise this period are now thought by many uh, doctors who've looked at their writings and everything else that both were on the autistic spectrum, both totally single-minded in what they were doing. Um, the miracles went on. Uh, here we have uh, Tintoretto's Augustine, uh, St. Augustine, healing the lame, a word for physically disabled people, or oh, here another one from the blind. So this is very much what was going on in Southern Europe. In the north, and I don't have time for it, but it's in the bulletin, you see artists like Bosch, the Bruegels, old, elder and, and uh, younger, painting much more disabled people as part of the community. Yes, making fun of them, often, putting a moral tale on it, but it wasn't just about curing miracles. We were more included in some ways in that art. Um, the invention of the printing press, in a, uh, which came from China, which had been doing it for about a thousand years before uh, supposedly Caxton invented it, but anyway, uh, it suddenly became a means of mass communication. It was the mass media of the day from 1480 onwards. Here's an interesting one, Louis XIV, some of you might have been watching the series last year, Versailles, and here we have Louis uh, in cr on crutches drawing through the um, heavens on a chariot driven by his mistress and attacked by the Dutch uh, lion. Now, you uh, watched all the episodes of Versailles, you would not have seen Louis XIV wearing crutches. He didn't use crutches, he, this is a sign of his weakness. And so, metaphor that disability is linked with weakness comes from all those times right through to today. Hogarth also used this in a moralistic way in many of his cartoons and pictures. Here we have the uh, the, the idle, idle apprentice and the good uh, work, working apprentice who's now wealthy, and on the other side of the street, the beggars, including a well known figure around London called Billy in the Bowl, who pushed himself around with hand crutches. 
Um, we have another one here with Gilray at the time of the Napoleonic Wars. John Bull, who was the epitome of the British man, sitting fat with roast beef. And uh, his family, not so fat because he ate most of it, uh, has to march off to war, still fat. His family then destitute while well, he's out fighting, of course. How does he come back? Well, not so well. He's, of course, uh, in quotes, crippled. So this is again a metaphor. And this comes right through today to Marvel Comics, where we see good looking good, bad looking bad. Batman, uh, two-faced in Batman, one side good, one side bad. And we have a whole range of these comics all the time being brought forward. Sometimes a twist like, um, you know, blind superheroes, but generally, if you look at Batman, the Penguin, physical impairment, the Riddler, mental health impairment, and so on. The baddies are there, same in James Bond. Uh, and so these ideas that came from these cartoons are very strong throughout the Western culture. Uh, a couple of artists who, who are really important, Francisco Goya uh, was a court painter in the Spanish courts, royal uh, families and so on, the mayor, both making and clothes, famous painting of his. But in 1792-3 he uh, acquired deafness, uh, which was followed then by uh, the invasion of Napoleon into Spain where there was a lot of slaughter of people and this really switched him from being someone who was a, a supporter of the, the Enlightenment. And here, this is uh, The Sleep of Reason, one of his cartoons about that. And then he goes into his rather ill-named black period, as if it's the negative thing. Of course, that's the racism of European culture. Uh, but here is Saturn eating his own children. And there are a number of these horrific pictures, which shows the transition from his uh, being a well-heeled court painter to being a disabled artist. Uh, female artist, the, you can look for many stories here. Sigrid Hartigen was a, a, a well-known uh, Swedish painter. She studied with Matisse, who also in his latter years was a wheelchair user. And uh, she did some famous paintings like this one of the studio or the red blind. And uh, in the end, Grunewald, who was her husband, who was not such a good painter, uh, overshadowed her and put pressure on her and she ended up having uh, a series of nervous breakdowns and being put in an institution. Um, on the other hand, Cam uh, Camilla Claudel was also uh, a pupil of the uh, disabled uh, sculptor Rodan. Rodan was so dyslexic that he couldn't actually get into any art college. He tried several times. He had to be an apprentice working on architectural features until eventually his, his, uh, his sculptures were welcomed but he embraced her as his lover and uh, pupil. She was actually better than him in some ways. Uh, he often claimed her work as his and uh, her mother was so ashamed of all of this immorality in the 1890s that she uh, sectioned her and she was the next 30 years in a mental asylum, even though doctors said there's nothing wrong with her. At that time in French law, the family held sway, and so that's where she stayed. So two examples of sort of how sexism and art operate together. A more recent example, uh, the Anglo-Portuguese uh, painter Paul Arrego, here one of her uh, pictures of the fascist uh, dictator, but she recently published a series of uh, ink and pen drawings, Galadin, of depression, which she had gone through all of her life. <laughs> Frida Kahlo uh, was perhaps an inspiration to many in the disability movement. She had polio, she had an accident at 19, which uh, put a rod through her pelvis, and she had many operations, including amputation at one point. She did much of her art on her back, uh, painting, as can be seen there. And she was perhaps the first artist really to make her art about her impairment, about the culture she lived in, Mexican culture, and about her socialism. Which is funny because at the Tory party conference, Theresa May was wearing a bangle of Frida Kahlo, a well-known Marxist socialist. So there we are, that's the time for us yet. Perhaps if we didn't see it in the budget today, perhaps the Tories are becoming socialists, I doubt it. Um, but Frida stands as a beacon for us uh, as we, we go forward, and many people, we have a group now 
disabled women called Sisters of Freedom picking up that torch and going forward. The disability arts movement followed the outsider movement that was identified by people like Dr. Hans Prinzhorn in the 1920s. He found that surprisingly these people who had been locked away in institutions could actually paint and do all sorts of things. And he championed that then uh, for a later art collector championed it in what was called Art Root, and then a new form of art came really as disabled people, particularly as they'd gone, the first generation that had gone into higher education began to express themselves, and that was really the beginning of the disability arts movement that we're going to hear more about in a minute. Uh, but here are a number of painters, and we've got one of the models here, where is she, Jane is in the room somewhere, uh, who featured in Tanya's uh, picture, which she'll tell you more about in a minute. Um, to end, really, then, also, we shouldn't forget BME, this British disabled artist, Yinka Shonabir, who started really challenging colonialism, picture at the bottom there, the uh, men without heads chopping up Africa, bringing wheelchairs in later, and more recently uh, become uh, part of the disability arts movement, a uh, patron of shape, I think, recently. But that we didn't start that way. Um, and then, okay, all right. San, Sanchita Islam, also a British uh, born Bangladeshi heritage, someone with psychotic episodes, well known artist, painter, but she, I think to be very honest, showing her psychotic figure, Fred, who comes up to her. And so, you know, this is the opening up of the things that we are not allowed to talk about, and I think very important. So I'll end on this cartoon, the white coated doctor from the medical model saying, Heal! to the man in the wheelchair, and of course he responds by getting to heal like a dog. So uh, we still have far to go in challenging oppression and uh, the way that it operates and the way everybody thinks about it. I'll leave it there.